Dr. Jackie, it is now 6.30 on the dot and we have 69 participants online. I think we can start. Great, thank you, Belle. Um, welcome, Dr. T. And for today, it's my second time hearing this, this presentation. And I'm very glad because I think I only absorbed about 50% of it this morning. So Dr. Tedesi McConnon is the Executive Director of Avica Health. He's played a leadership role in successfully launching the Namibian HIV Clinical Mentoring Program, and additionally has successfully led all the preparatory work for and launch of the HIV test and treat pilot in Namibia, including development of implementation protocols, evaluation protocols, monitoring and evaluation frameworks, activity planning and budgeting. He also won the Young Investigators Award for Clinical Science, Care and Treatment category at the International Conference on AIDS and STIs in Africa in 2015 for the work he did in early pediatric HIV management, viral remission and proviral DNA reversion. And he has successfully trained and coached clinical mentors across the country supported by establishment of an adolescent-friendly health center for HIV-infected adolescents in Oshikati Intermediate Hospital in Namibia. He has supported the strengthening of pediatric HIV care, treatment, and pediatric HIV disclosure. And among many of his achievements, he has led the successful launching of the ECHO model of virtual training and mentoring in Namibia, with close technical and financial support from UNM, CDC, EG, PAF, UW, and ITEC. This is the first ever ECHO launched on the African continent, and some African countries are showing interest to replicate the practice in their settings. So welcome, Dr. T. I look forward to hearing your talk for the second time today. And this time I have a pad and a piece of paper because I need to record everything you say because this morning's talk was so incredible. We are going to have a question and answer session on the 30th of August, 2023, um, in case we can't cover everything for today's session. But in the hope that we can, I'd like to introduce Dr. T and welcome you to the floor. And thank you for everything you've put into this. Thank you, Dr. T. Good evening, colleagues. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, um, Dr. Stone. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. You need to get your screen onto presentation mode. Yeah. Is it is it okay now? Well, you have to ask Bell because I'm not very really technologically competent, but it looks better. Okay. Yes, Bell. Dr. T is on PowerPoint. It's on presentation mode. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you for that kind of introduction. And again, Intellectus Campus, Avakir Health Group, thank you for really <clears throat> creating this platform and sustaining it to, to, to spread the knowledge and for our joint learning. This is really much appreciated. And this is a rare uh, intervention by healthcare companies um, in our region. So we appreciate that. Good evening, our colleagues uh, from different parts of Africa. I could already see some of my colleagues from my prior um, life, my old life, my other life. So happy to see you here. And uh, we look forward to really uh, an engaging session and also for, for discussions and learning from everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for facilitating this as well. So colleagues, um, as you know, the International Aid Society Conference, the scientific one happens every two years. And this year it happened in, in Brisbane. Some of you might have also been there. So we try to summarize some of the key findings from this conference uh, in a way that it could be immediately relevant for our setting, or even if it is a long shot from now, at least we know that it will be coming. Um, 
We will touch on some updates on treatment, treatment-related adverse events, prevention, and also a couple of studies on TB and HIV co-infection. <clears throat> uh, I think the, the limelight of the conference was on this development guideline recommendation. Uh, a real breakthrough. Colleagues, you remember, we used to talk about undetectable is equal to untransmissible. In other words, we're saying that people who have undetectable viral load have a potential not to transmit the virus until we learn it this year by, from a, a result of a systematic review published by the Lancet on 23rd journal, on the same day where WHO also revised their guideline on the role of viral suppression in improving individual health and uh, reducing transmission, they have firmly stated and confirmed that undetectable viral load is equal to zero risk of HIV transmission, which is such a really relieving and great news. Um, after so much learning over the years, after test and treat, after adequate viral suppression, the world has reached to a level where it can comfortably say that undetectable viral load is equal to zero HIV transmission. So this is now included in the WHO guidance as of as from 23rd July this year. It has multifaceted importance. Number one, for people living with HIV and their families, it will instill a sense of normal living, normal sexual and reproductive health. They can plan for their family. They can have kids without HIV infection. It also tells us a lot about the capacity that this world has to control, contain, control, and eliminate HIV infection. Because if we reach a level of undetectable community viral load, then there is no HIV transmission in that community. In other words, the reproductive number of the virus will be zero. So what will happen is we'll have only prevalent cases and theoretically zero incident cases. So elimination of HIV will be a possibility. I think the third colossal public health advantage is that with untransmissible state, the risk of transmission of drug resistant virus will also be null. So not only controlling HIV, but spreading HIV drug resistance could also be contained. So it's such, such an important development and congratulations to everyone who has been the clinical practice and the scientific community for us to be able to reach here. However, there is no free lunch. This would happen only if a person is taking their medication and the viral load is suppressed at all times. If there is any rebound viremia, the risk of transmission is there. If there is any rebound viremia, the risk of selective pressure and development selection of resistance is there. So that will not take that away. So the principle is undetectable viral load with great adherence, transmission will be there. But this systematic review also revealed that when the viral load was less than 1,000 RNA copies per ml, again, the risk of transmission is negligible. The risk is very, very low. We used to hear about uh, you know, sperm washing and the like, especially in the US, earlier during the days when HIV infected individuals want to have you know, babies. This is in the early 2000s, late 1990s. Studies even at that time showed that viral load less than 1,500 copies. Actually, the risk of infection was, was very low. So again, this has repeated, repeated this, less than 1,000, negligible, but the risk is not zero. But if it is undetectable, zero transmission. This is such a wonderful news to, to the entire world. Further, in terms of uh, treatment, as you all know, dual therapy has been getting the limelight and getting more and more uh, attention over the last uh, years, especially with dolutegravir as an anchor drug of the two molecules in the dual therapy. Um, in this regard, um, sorry, colleagues, I'm just trying to arrange this screen. Um, so, um, Dolutegravir with emtricitabine or um, lamivudine has been reckoned as 
one of the effective regimen that can reduce the, the number of you know, antivirals that people will take and also toxicity, and it may have also health economic advantage. Uh, we have been hearing more and more about it the last four or five years, um, and it has been included in the guidelines in the US and in the European Union. This year, um, Solar 3D actually investigated further what would the outcome of a dual therapy would be in an event that this resistant prone m or lamuvudin um, has developed resistance or M184V or I has been selected. As you know, lamuvudin is, they are to our knowledge, it is the first antiretroviral or the weakest antiretroviral in terms of genetic barrier to resistance. It selects you know, M184B really quickly. So they looked at, they did a prospective open level comparative studies that ran for two, two years. They recruited adults with infection with viral load less than 50 copies who have been on either dual, triple, or quadruple therapy for at least six months and had evidence of prior virologic failure. And they didn't exclude integrase inhibitors in the past as well, which is important, and uh, any CD4 count as well. And any NRTI mutations or M M184V or even k 65 r which is a signature mutation for tenofovir uh, or uh, abacavir. So they stratified this into two groups, one arm, had patients with M184V mutation. In other words, 100% of the efficacy of m 3 or lamivudine is knocked out. So it is not effective at all. And on the other arm, patients who didn't select M184V mutation where Sritis is fully, the virus was fully susceptible to <clears throat> Sritis C. So keep in mind, in other words, to put it into perspective, one arm was DTG monotherapy with M184V mutation, and the other arm was dual therapy with no 3TC M184V mutation. The primary endpoint was RNA copies more than 50 copies per ml at week 48. The finding was very interesting. If you look at the, the right side of this, this slide, you would see that at week 48, for practical purposes, one year later, 92% of the patients who were actually receiving DTG without effective 3TC suppressed, maintained the viral suppression, and 88% from the other arm with DTG and 3TC fully active suppressed the virus. And there was no statistically significant difference. At week 46, 96, basically more or less there's no difference, 790% viral maintenance of viral suppression. So, um, further analyzing data in a window, but HIV RNA more than 50 copies, less than 200 copies, but more, more than 50 copies, 4% from historical M184V arm and 2% from no M184V arm. So no case of virologic failure, no treatment emergent resistance through week 96. This is another interesting thing. So what does this tell us? Does this tell us that monotherapy is as good as dual therapy? I don't think, um, but rather, as you all may know, would definitely know, m 4 v mutations, some mutations are harmful for the virus, some mutations are useful for the virus. We know for a long time that m 4 v actually puts pressure on viral replication capacity, where the virus pays a, repl a replicative cost or cost of fitness cost, the virus multiplies slowly. So it gives opportunity for DTG actually to, to, to unleash its activity on the remaining you know, poorly multiplying virus. So that could be the effect of M184V. And as you know, when we're treating patients with salvage therapy, with multi-drug resistant HIV, we always maintain 3TC in the regimen to keep them M184V so that the viral replicative capacity is attenuated. That could be the reason, but at least we know that resistant or susceptible when 3TC was given with DTG, it was good enough to maintain viral suppression at two years. Another study, uh, open label single arm prospective studies that evaluated the PK safety and efficacy of Bictagravir with m 3 and TAF during pregnancy reported their results at this conference as well. 
So you all know women and children usually are late entrants into clinical trials because of safety concerns, especially related to embryogenesis or teratogenicity. So in this study, we knew that prior studies show that there will be lower exposure of pictogravure uh, during pregnancy, and it is not a secret with the massive plasma expansion in pregnancy, the serum, the, the, the dilution, so the concentration would be lower. But was that a deal breaker? Was that really affecting efficacy? Was that below the minimum inhibitory concentration? So this study answered that. So 33 pregnant women with HIV RNA copies less than 50 treated with Bictegravir FT staff for up to 38 weeks from second trimester all the way up to some up to 12 weeks postpartum. It was to see the steady, the steady PK uh, characteristics of Bictegravir and also in secondary objective to look at if the viral suppression would be sustained. So what they find out was that <clears throat> if you see the lower curve, the yellow curve on the lower side here is the third trimester concentration of Bictagravir. And in the second trimester, the green, the green curve, it behaved as such. And that the dark gray curve or blue curve, which you see on top is 12 weeks postpartum. And then the red one is six weeks postpartum. So you can see postpartal concentration of Bictagravir has actually surged within six weeks. And it tells you that the, the, the fast plasma contraction leading to concentration, and there will be enough area, enough, enough tissue exposure, exposure of the tissue and cells to this, to this big gravia. But what is so interesting was that the concentrations, whatever was available was much higher than the first interquartile concentration um, range. But, one thing which was so instructive in this evaluation was the intracellular concentration of Bictagravia triphosphate was looked at. And in this case, what they found out was the concentration of Bictagravia during second and third trimester was not significantly different in the intracellular space as compared to concentrations postpartum. Moreover, they also observed that 100% of the women maintained viral suppression to less than 50 copies at delivery and there was no any vertical HIV transmission. The concentration in the cord blood was actually about 1.4, 1.5 times higher than the blood. It also shows that the gravier actually could readily you know, pass through the blood placenta barrier and hence reduces the risk of transmission. So with this, the study, uh, the investigators recommended that the gravier could be used as a standard treatment, as part of standard antiretroviral therapy in pregnant women without any dose adjustment. And Bictagravir, equally effective to Dolutagravir, may have marginal advantage on weight gain, still disputable, uh, could be then an option for our setting as well in the private sector if, if available. And we hope at some point it will also find itself in the WHO guidelines. Another, another study that was conducted and looked at uh, long-acting injectables as potential HIV treatment options um, in, in women who, in patients who received antiretroviral therapy and suppressed their virus durably, but have complicated complex social needs. Hence, maintaining or sustaining daily dosing of oral antiretrovirals would be difficult. So in this study, patients were collect, selected from Australia because of their complex social circumstances, physical comorbidities, polypharmacy, neurocognitive disorders, or drug abuse, or substance abuse, or other mental health issues were recruited into this study and received long-acting cabotegravir and rilpivirin every two months injection. And they monitored the viral suppression over time. But maintenance of viral suppression. But what was so interesting was 97.2% of the people recruited into the study had good adherence. 97.2% of these people were able to come for their repeat injection every two months within, within seven months, days before or seven days after the due date for that injection. And interestingly, 82.3% of these people actually came on that exact same appointment. 
which was which was very interesting and very encouraging, especially looking at the complex social health and other comorbid states that these people were in. In terms of virologic outcomes, at one year, 98% of the people actually maintained full viral suppression. And then there was only 1% who had detectable viral load, more than 50 copies, but it was marginally elevated at 55 copies, and it was less than 200 copies. So this patient was not actually failure. So for practical reasons, the purpose is then we could say 100% of the people actually have suppressed. Adverse events were not, were not really common. Uh, grade three adverse events were not reported, but grade one, two adverse events were less than 2%. So again, it, it shows the promise of long-acting injectables. Of course, there are always limitations, especially in, 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 you know, in the face of uh, poor adherence and long pharmacological care. Mm -hmm. Another mm -hmm. study mm -hmm. that is, um, colleagues, when you are not speaking, if you can kindly mute your mic, it will be helpful for us to be able to hear each other well. Another study that was reported at this conference was a report from the Doravirin Islatravir trial uh, that compared um, its efficacy and safety with the standard Vitegravir TAF and FTC. As you know, Doravirin is not new. Islatravir has been on trial. It's a wonderful novel drug which has exceptional potency even in, in, in a level of uh, nano or smaller state. You can see that is 0.75 milligram. In other words, 75 microgram. It's a very, very small dose. Um, it is from a nucleus, and it's the only member of that family in nucleoside reverse transcriptin, transcriptase, or transcription translocation inhibitor. Every time when there is the proviral DNA synthesis or during the reverse transcription, the amino acids should be, you know, should be sequenced to, to form the DNA complementary strand from the RNA. And at that time, every time the amino acids are put in place, they should be pushed distally to form that sequence. So that pushing distally after the amino acid is put in place is called translocation. A reverse transcription has happened and that to be translocated distally to form that chain or complementary sequence of amino acids. That's exactly what the Islatravir does. So as you know, there was a sad story about a year or so ago uh, in, in Montreal that was reported. The Islatravir study was held back because of lymphopenia, but after a whole, it was, it was released and the results were reported. So in this double-blind randomized phase three trial, treatment naive HIV infected people with detectable viral load more than 500 and have never received any treatment. And there's no documented resistance, prior resistance, and they were not hepatitis B infected. They were randomized one to one. One arm received dual therapy with doravirin 100 milligrams, Islatravil 0.75 milligrams and the standard Bictagravi FTC TAF on the other arm, followed over a year, 96 weeks, over 168 weeks. So the finding at 48 weeks was that there was no difference in viral load suppression between Islatravi Doravirin and the standard Bictagravi FTAF regimen, and the suppression was comparable with other DTG uh, related uh, DTG based regimen studies in the in the past as well. And in terms of resistance, there was one patient who had NNRTI and NRTI resistance. Um, definitely one or six, two to five confer resistance to doravirin, which is also an nucleoside reverse transcriptase. What was so interesting was to see M184 I selected in this case, it must have been an existing uh, pre-treatment drug resistance that were in 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 in, in, a, in, a, in a minority quasi species and in, in, the, in the patient was one picked up with standard sequencing at at the beginning of treatment. In any case, um, that didn't do any harm. In terms of weight change over time, which is now a major concern for everyone studying newer newer molecules. There was no difference between, in terms of weight gain, between doravirin, slatravir, and bictagravir regimen. An average weight gain of 3.45 for doravirin, slatravir versus BFTAF 
3.32. So from weight gain points of view, we may not really uh, gain anything much from Doravirin about Isla travel. However, one thing that was shown in this study was also there was numerically higher rates of lymphopenia or decrease in lymphocyte count in general, including those requiring uh, switching treatment off from Islatravir. But what they learned, the investigators learned, was that this lymphopenic effect of Islatravir was dose dependent. And we know very well that a very small dose of Islatravir can achieve similar efficacy. So now a 0.25 milligram dose of Islatravir is progressing in development. So we'll see what 0.25 milligram dose will do. We don't doubt the efficacy. It's likely, it will be unlikely to change that, but the lymphopenic effect is we, we will be waiting with anxiety to see what will come. If it is found to be safe, that will be a new hope on the horizon really to, to add on the armamentarium that we have, especially where we are gambling or banking on dolutegravir in first line, second line, and certain regimens. The other report this year was a very interesting um, um, manuscript submitted from the advanced trial group from South Africa that compared efficacy, safety, and other qualitative studies. They submitted so many manuscripts to different conferences and published quite some as well, was that, okay, X number of patients fell to treatment in this, in this study from different, from all the three arms. How many of them or which proportion of them actually suppressed the viral load after adherence intervention? And the finding was very instructive and very important for two reasons. We'll come to that. So what happened was patients who received DTG containing ARVs, they were DTG FTC TAF or DTG FTC TDF. These were two arms. And the third arm was a five range FTC and TDF. So patients who failed to antiretrovirals by the public health guideline definition in South Africa were subjected to intensive adherence counseling. And the viral loads were monitored um, consistently. Then 24 weeks after adherence intervention, 88% of patients who failed to DTG were able to resuppress their viral load. And from the efavirenz arm, 46% of the patients who failed initially actually resuppressed the virus. At week 48, even further, 95% of the people failed to DTG suppress the virus again, and 66% of those on efavirenz suppress the virus. So I think that the best message we get from here is that not every failure or virologic failure is due to resistance. In fact, the biggest proportion of failure to antiretrovirals is due to poor adherence, which progressively can cause resistance, not the other way around. What is very impressive is even with efavirenz, two thirds of the patients actually resuppress. But the danger of the keeping efavirenz as a failing regimen, as you all know, is selection of resistance and virtually no NNRTI is immune to cross resistance within that class. Um, even doravirin could, could be affected to some extent by cross resistance. So the second message is that it shows dolutegravir is still a very robust, solid drug, but it is not also bulletproof. It can it can develop resistance over time. So we, I know we took some, some good amount of time on this, but so in summary, from the treatment side, the key studies summarized showed that undetectable viral load, zero chance of HIV transmission. So what do we do next? I think, you know, my opinion is that it is time for every public health policymakers and clinicians and other decision makers to intensify viral, viral load monitoring, to create universal access to viral load monitoring. It, is, it has been and it will be the most important indicator for us to see if the treatment is working and to make timely decision, especially when we know that undetectable is equal to untransmittable. If possible, any patient in the remote peripheral community should have access for regular viral load monitoring. 
maybe point of care where a lot of techno monitoring technology could be the answer to give that sustainable solution to our patients. The second study, as you saw, prior resistance to FTC or CDC doesn't affect efficacy of dual therapy. Bictagravir achieved sufficient concentration during pregnancy and postpartum, including excellent maintenance of suppression, solid 100%. Long-acting capotegravir showed good maintenance of suppression as well, uh, especially in patients with, you know, in, this, in that study with patients with complex medical and social circumstances. It was a, there was a redemption to the Doravirin and Islatravir clinical trial, and we hope 0.25 milligram in, in the subsequent studies will show positive results from both safety profile and also efficacy point of view. Resuppression of the virus was huge, almost 100% in patients who failed to do gravia. So intensive adherence found counseling, but also more importantly, viral load, viral load, viral load monitoring accessible to everyone on HIV treatment and point of care viral load testing could be could have the answer. Uh, quickly going over to reported studies on uh, various adverse events in patients being treated for HIV. Um, I think one of the landmark studies reported in this conference was the, uh, the, the Reprive study that simply used pita, pita vastatin in patients with, with HIV and on treatment to see the effect of this statin on cardiovascular disease prevention or risk aversion of major adverse cardiovascular adverse events and including days. So in this study, they recruited 7,769 patients from 12 countries, including our own Uganda, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and South Africa. And in one arm, in patients who are asymptomatic, uh, living with HIV on ART, um, with low to moderate risk of um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, one arm received pitavastatin with antiretrovirals, and then the other arm received a pitavastatin placebo. Pitavastatin is a moderately intense, uh, you know, intensity, moderate intensity statin, unlike rosuvastatin or atorvastatin. These patients were followed up to eight years, and the findings were really compelling. As you would see on the left um, graph here, there was a 35% reduction in the risk of developing major adverse cardiovascular event. Looking at the gravity of a major cardiovascular event where most of the time would be fatal in a predominantly rural, less developed healthcare infrastructure setting like ours, a 35% reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events is huge. When they used a composite endpoint of major adverse cardiovascular event or days, there was again a 20, 21% reduction in, in this composite endpoint. So because of statins anti-inflammatory effect and also their effect in lowering serum triglycerides and cholesterol level, we hope this evidence would be strong enough to recommend their use in people living with HIV and on treatment and have at least some degree of adverse cardiovascular event risk in their lifetime. When they disaggregated the data by different parameters, as you could see that almost everything was favoring the use of pitavastatin. Again, including whichever region they come from, including the level of low density lipoprotein age, sex, your gender, race, and, and CD4 count. So very, very, very landmark study that was reported. And this was presented as the coacher's choice um, at the conference. Another theme that gained so much attention during this conference was weight gain. Every study is trying to, even if that was not the main purpose of the study, was trying to see if there is any weight gain related to with this drug or that drug. So this study, these two studies, one open label phase three study and another one double blind phase three study, both are switch studies, looked at 
the trend of change in weight in patients who were either receiving doravirin with slatravir or patients who maintained baseline RT, but later on goes went into, into um, open level extension to doravirin and slatravir. That is the open level study. And the double blind one randomized patients into doravirin and slatravir versus bictagravir, FTC, and TAR. And looking at the change in weight, in fact, Overly, overly, as you hear, there was no difference in the change in weight between doravirin, islatravir, and integrase strand transceptor, you know, uh, including antiretroviral. In fact, in quite some instances, the weight gain was actually more in patients who received islatravir and doravirin. So as, as excited as we are with doravirin and slatravir, we may not get actually benefit around weight gain. Um, another study that also reported their findings was in a switch study, if we shift patients from integrase inhibitor anchor drug ART into a PI-based regimen, what would, what would happen? So with an initial hypothesis that in any way, the result will be compelling that, you know, a PI will have lesser weight gain as compared to integrase inhibitors. Patients was, were randomized, virologically suppressed patients with more than or equal to 10% body weight gain with a set six months of ART and who were on integrase inhibitor containing antiretroviral, randomized into a darunavir cobicistat FTAF and an integrase inhibitor FTAF. And then after 24 weeks, then they moved into an open label extension with um, Darunavir with Kobe FTAF. And they would like, they wanted to see actually the change in body weight over time. And what you see on this slide is that the weight gain from baseline or from randomization over 40, over 24 weeks was not actually different between the two groups. Uh, in fact, you would see that patients with Darunavir. Uh, had slightly higher weight gain, but it is not statistically significant. So this was an interesting, an interesting finding. But another interesting finding was the intensity of weight gain or the slope of weight gain in patients who were on integrase inhibitor was on the contrary. It was either flat out or it was just below zero, the change. Is it an effect that maybe weight gain on integrase inhibitors do not last forever? We don't know. Uh, it's, it's, we, can't, we can't deduce anything from here, but the observation is as you see here. Now, another interesting uh, observational study report was that in circumstance where patients were shifted from another regimen into an integrase inhibitor regimen, either a bictavgravir containing regimen or a dolutegravir containing regimen. And they looked at how the weight change behaves. And the finding in this report was that patients who were switched to a bictavgravir containing regimen had a lesser analyzed weight gain as compared to dolutegravir. Maybe that could be a marginal benefit that bictavgravir may bring uh, to us. Not only weight gain was uh, attracting the attention of uh, many in the, in the field of HIV science, but also hypertension, but also dyslipidemia and a treatment emergent uh, hyperglycemia or diabetes mellitus. So a few studies have been looked into or summarized here. NAMSAL, as you know, this is a very famous uh, DTG efavirenz comparing, especially efavirenz 400 comparing trial done in Cameroon. West Africa, they reported comparable efficacy and progressively more efficacy to for dolutegravir. And this safety analysis, they found that hypertension increased treatment, incident hypertension increased over time in both dolutegravir and efavirenz R. But there was a significantly higher systolic blood pressure in patients who received dolutegravir by week 60. And there was also significant difference in the percentage of patients who had systolic blood pressure more than 140 and diastolic blood pressure more than 90 by three years of follow-up. And then again, patients who received dolutegravir had significantly higher risk of developing treatment emergent hypertension at four years of follow-up. 
Advanced trial from South Africa has also looked into this, and they reported that treatment emergent grade one hypertension was significantly higher for patients who received olutegravir at again three years. This is real long-term data from a clinical trial point of view. Um, D2EFT study, and at week 48, there was significantly higher mean change in the systolic and diastolic pressure with diolutegravir as compared to a darunavir-containing regimen. Uh, circling back home from Newlands Clinic, they also reported that for patients on DTG, there was an increased risk of developing hypertension anywhere between 5% to 20% at two years. Not only that this effect actually is there, but it is also increasing. The risk continues to increase while people are on treatment and that the risk is higher in patients with obesity, obesity and more so with morbid obesity. So again, the data that we've been hearing over the last few years around incident hypertension with dolutegravir in many different settings that is still coming into the picture, making the evidence stronger and stronger to a level that now we need to make clinical decision to say whom not to give dolutegravir in a case-by-case -case basis. Definitely patients with increased risk of hypertension um, or, or even um, hypertension might benefit from an endolithogravir based regimen. Again, it is, it is subject to a case-by-case -case analysis, but the evidence is growing and getting stronger to, to compel some clinical decisions. In terms of um, response studies that actually looked at both weight gain, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes, from hypertension, current use of Integrase inhibitor with or without TAF was associated with incident hypertension. And this was in a study that had a 39, almost a 40,000 person years of follow up. This is a huge study with a very long um, term patient follow up. So the, the evidence could even be stronger. Looking at the uh, dyslipidemia, uh, they were able to see also. After adjustment, for, they were able to see that there was an increased risk of dyslipidemia in patients on integrase inhibitor with or without TAF. Again, um, with a follow-up of almost 20,000 person years of follow-up. When the BMI state was adjusted with time, there was an attenuated risk, a reduction in the risk of um, uh, dyslipidemia. Um, however, in general, dyslipidemia was higher in patients who used integrase inhibitor. Treatment emergent on incident hyperglycemia or diabetes mellitus was actually higher in patients who received integrase inhibitors as well. And then the association was even stronger in patients who had blood, high blood pressure um, while in, in the... So in summary, the use of, again, the use of pitavastatin reduced... Uh, major adverse cardiovascular events in PLHIV, and I hope that will shape our practice uh, probably immediately. Uh, I think this is really um, strong evidence. And remember, pitavastatin has a modern, um, moderate intensity in lowering um, uh, lipid serum lipid concentration, or plasma lipid concentrations, rather. Um, and the likes of rosuvastatin and atorvastatin have been safe uh, to be used with uh, antiretrovirals. So I think those choices can be, can be considered. Weight changes in different switch studies showed mixed results from similar or slightly higher change, even pronounced change with islatravir, to no difference uh, after switch in a daruravir switch study, and also with switch to bictagravir or DTG showing slightly uh, lesser increase in bictagravir. Treatment emergent hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes mellitus all were consistently seen to be associated with the use of integrase inhibitors, including dolutegravir. Quickly going over through prevention, I know there's a lot of information, we'll finish soon, um, but again, we can, we can also recap on August 30. 
PrEP, again, when we talk about HIV prevention, either it is vaccine or PrEP uh, predominantly. And we'll talk maybe at the next section a bit about vaccines, but on PrEP, um, there was an open level extension um, from HPTN084 study in the past. Uh, we knew that long acting carbotagravir has superior HIV prevention efficacy or efficiency rather with two people out of every 1,000 followed over a year could acquire infection with carbotagravir as compared to almost 19 patients on FTC-TDF followed over a year out of 1,000 would have picked HIV infection. So in this study, what they did was they asked participants to choose either oral regimen, FTC-TDF, or they shift to long-acting carbotagravir. And interestingly, close to 80% of the people who were given the choice actually moved to long-acting injectables. And predominantly, um, these people are likely to be people who are not living with one partner or likely to have been paid uh, for sex, transactional sex, or, or the like. And then the reasons for selecting carbotagravir was that they prefer the injection, they don't like the pills, uh, that they say it is convenient or discreet or easier to adhere. They, some of them also knew that carbotogravir was superior and others also would like to avoid the side effects of uh, TDFFTC. This is this constituted up to 80% of the people. Uh, the remaining 20%, 22% that chose FTC-TDF said they prefer pills, they don't like injections, um, some of them are concerned about injection site pain, clinic visit more more efficient with FTC TDF, pregnancy and uh, you know and teratogenicity and the like. So this was the choice predominantly shifted to carbotagravir. And then interestingly, one of the fear we had was that imagine this was done. In the, in, the, in the eastern coast of the United States in Washington, D.C. And our worry was that while we are trying to demedicalize PrEP with a carbotagravir injectable administration, which is a depot, a long, long needle, uh, tricky administration, we are going to remedicalize PrEP. We are going to use nurses to administer that. But this trial in the US was done by non-medically licensed trained community health workers. And then this community health workers were able to administer 314 initiation and then to, 200, to 139 PrEP users. And they achieved 95% re retention for second infection, injection and 91% for the third injection. It was an amazing finding and it is such a perfect implementation science research and showed that if community health care workers are trained effectively, they can actually administer long acting carbotagravir in our settings as well. So that is really reassuring to, 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 to hear this. Another interesting report was the use of FTC and TAF in the context of PrEP simply they found out that there was higher risk of developing hypertension and also higher risk of initiating statins due to clinically relevant dyslipidemia when patients were taking FTC and TAF. This is adding, adding um, further concern to the use of oral PrEP agent, but this is one study to my knowledge and we hope we'll hear more about this, this finding that either nullifies or, um, or, or, or strengthens this finding. Another interesting, but still early stage uh, development was the use of Islatravir as a prodrug. As you all know, we have used alafenamide to package an active drug called tenofovir in a prodrug form, and it achieved efficient release into the penetration through the gut wall, into the plasma, and even into the intracellular compartment, making tenofovir alafenamide a very, very efficient uh, product of tenofovir. In this case, in this PrEP, uh, early stage in vitro and in vivo release study, what they looked at was 
a subcutaneous biodegradable implant of islatravir as an active drug versus a novel prodrug islatravir alfanamide. And they looked at the release rate over time. When they I used the subcutaneous biodegradable uh, islatravil implant. There was a 48 plus or minus 12 microgram per day release for up to 99 days from 15 days um, onwards. When they used the alafenamide uh, prodrug, there was a huge increase in the daily re release rate of up to 201. This is very early days, but we hope we see islatravir in the pre-exposure prophylaxis stage, stay in you know, a space with this novel delivery mechanism as an implant as well. This is a long shot, but it's a space to watch as well. Um, then in general, in summary, uh, preference for long-acting cabotegravir among PrEP users was very clear in the, in the Western world, in the US. We also see that, have seen that administration of long-acting carb injections using non-medical trained community health workers were made possible. FTAF was associated with treatment of emergency dyslipidemia and hypertension in PrEP users. And the early stage evidence on islatravir alafenamide as a superior uh, uh, release formulation as an implant sustained over, over 100 days. From tuberculosis point of view, um, one study reported the use of um, isoniazide and rifapentin as a, for one month, um, daily for one month versus weekly for three months as a TB preventive therapy in Thai population in patients who are being treated either with a favrins or dolutegravir. Viral suppression was great in both groups, uh, whether it is DTG or a favrins. Uh, there was no significant difference in the level of uh, uh, liver dysfunction in this in this group. And also, sure. whether one month or three months isoniazide preventive therapy uh, was effective both in TB prevention, but also there was no significant interaction leading to suboptimal viral response in, in from the HIV treatment side. Uh, another one, integrase inhibitor-based antiretroviral in people living with HIV to, in tuberculosis. Uh, the finding was that Again, integrase inhibitor medication based antiretrovirals showed good efficacy despite short course of rifapentin, unlike our fear in the past with an intention to treat analysis above 95% suppression rate uh, over, over the follow up period. And then the risk of developing iris in patients who received raltegravir, which, which, which has always been the fear, was not also as pronounced as. We, we always we always felt. So integrase inhibitors could be safely uh, utilized in patients who are receiving rifapentin, but some studies are also coming up in Africa, uh, in, South, in South Africa and in Mozambique, looking into this space as well. Um, so colleagues, I know it, is, it was a long, so many studies summarized in just uh, maybe an hour or so. Apologies for the long talk, but I hope they were able to give some insights from the IAS 2023. Thank you for your patience and over to you, Dr. Stone. Thank you, Dr. T. That was an amazing presentation and a huge amount of information to be absorbed. So I think that the 30th of August will be a good yeah. Q&A session. And I look forward to the questions from the audience. Hello. Hi, Dr. Jackie. There are a few questions and comments in the chat. Okay, I'm going through the chat at the moment. Well. Hello, good evening. Good evening, Petrus. Go ahead. 
Dr. T, there's some questions in the chat. I'm going to go ahead with some of them. Um, one of them is, Dr. T, we are in Namibia aggressively advocating for undetectable viral load and mm -hmm. making the patients understand the importance of it. Can you comment mm -hmm. on that? Thanks, Dr. Stone. Sorry, I, I lost you the first part. Maybe can you come again, please? So, in Namibia, Hello. Mm -hmm. can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, Doc, I can hear you, but there's also okay. background. So, in Namibia, people yes. or the doctors are aggressively advocating for undetectable viral load and making patients understand the importance of it. Can you comment on how we can get patients to maintain undetectable viral load? Yeah, so very, they, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Who is speaking? Um, I think they, someone is speaking in the background. They are following the viral load when they do the testing. And then when the viral load is below 20 or target not detected, so they still do the adherence and continue with the treatment as it is what on my side I saw. Yes, so yeah, a couple of things. I think this is a very important practical question and that's the, the most important question in fact. Uh, viral load should not only be suppressed but it has to stay suppressed for so many, so many reasons. Um, so I think the most important thing yes, is to educate yeah. our people, to okay. educate our patients to a level not only that they develop awareness about the benefits of undetectable viral load, but also to develop the critical attitude towards sustainable adherence to treatment. And I think what undetectable is equal to zero transmission can add to the messaging is that it also brings in a new hope, new inspiration to our patients, new reward to our patients that their day-to-day -day adherence to treatment is not in vain. They contribute to a healthy life to themselves, to their family, to the family that they may desire to build to bring to the world, to give birth, to conceive and give birth, but also to the world that they arrest HIV transmission. But even more than that, they also reduce the risk of developing ugly non-communicable diseases. The moment the virus is detectable, is multiplying, it is not only damaging the immune system, CD4 cells, or you know, ability to, to prevent diseases, but it's also increases the risk of immune hyperactivation, indolent inflammation, leading to non-communicable diseases, diabetes mellitus, risk of hypertension, chronic kidney disease, and the like. So I think we need to make even stronger case, stronger um, uh, information provision, awareness creation, and the development of critical attitudes to good adherence. I think that's all what we can do at the moment. But on the other side, we should also change the practice of our viral load monitoring. When I was in Northern Namibia earlier during the days, we do viral load today and the result will come to the patient after six weeks or two months. By that time, so many things may have happened in the life of that patient. Might have developed resistance before we pick the viral load, might have transmitted the virus. In some cases may have also developed opportunistic infections. But more importantly, we have not given the news to the patient that they are also suppressing or not suppressing. So viral load testing should be followed by a shorter term around time to providing the results. And the answer could be 
point of care viral load testing. Maybe I think practice and information provision together can help change the attitude of our patients to a desirable level. I hope that addresses addresses that. Um, over to you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. T, and I agree with you 100%. I think that one of the concerns is that um, it takes so long for a patient to actually get the result that alters their behavior. And mm -hmm. care testing is incredibly important. And um, in the community that we're involved in, I think that we need to really address point of care testing. So I'd be very interested to hear any comments from anyone in the audience. Hello. Yes, who's speaking? Colleagues, could you kindly request that you raise your hands if you'd like to raise your hand if you'd like to speak, just to avoid confusion. There are several people on muting at the same time. Thank you. G, you gave the most amazing presentation and it was so full of information. I think we should um, go for the raised hands for the next five to 10 minutes. And then I think on the 30th, we should go through this entire presentation with people with questions again. So for the other raised hands, I think, um, Belle, can you bring those people on to ask the questions and then we can, we can progress to ending this session with the aim of creating another session so that the questions that all of us have to be answered are answered. Noted, thank you. The first one was for Fwashia. I hope I'm saying that right. Washaya, please unmute and go ahead. Washaya, your hand is up. Okay, can we then move to Belinda? Yeah, can I speak now? Yes, please go ahead. Belinda will come back to you. Sorry about that. Uh, good evening, Dr. Tadese. I would like to use this opportunity to thank you for the nice presentation. I'm talking from Namibia uh, in the southern region of Namibia, at the Karas region, in the town of Ketmatsop. Uh, Dr. Lama Okitemungu. Uh, may you kindly share your presentation on our email? Dr. Lama, so happy to hear your voice after after how many years now? And thank you to more than ten audience. years. <laughs> Very happy to hear your voice. Yeah, definitely we'll share we'll share the slides. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Thank you. Mm. Belinda, please go ahead. <laughs> Belinda? Belinda, I think your network is unstable. I see you're unmuting, but there's no sound. Or can anyone hear Belinda? Okay. 
Okay, Belinda, please kindly. No, type we your can't hear you. Yeah. Okay, Belinda, kindly type your question in the chat. Uh, Dr. T, there are a few other questions in the chat. Do you want to take them and then we close at 1940? Sure, Bell. Um, there is another hand, Pascal Shambira. Um, okay. Maybe... Yes, please, Pascal, do go ahead. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so my question is on the long-acting uh, carbotegraviral preverin for treatment of HIV. So patients who received this, uh, did, did it also include patients who had previously received uh, NRTIs, like efavirenz and neverapine, and had actually failed uh, on that? Because I remember uh, some of the resistance patterns in F2 efavirenz and neverapine also have resistance to rilprivine. So I'm just wondering uh, for future use, since many of our patients who are treatment experienced have actually been exposed to efavirenz and nevirapine, and quite a number of them have had a failure uh, to this regimen. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very, very important question, Pascal. In this, in this, these were 60 patients, um, as you might have noted, and they didn't report on prior um, antiretroviral use history, except that these people actually have fully suppressed the virus at the time when they were shifted into long-acting capotegravir and rilpivirin. So that is the information that was obtained from this report. However, we know that to some extent there could be cross resistance between a favorite, especially if it was hit very hard and used under selective pressure for a long time, selecting 103, 106, 225 mutations that can, especially 225 mutation that can confer resistance to repivirin as well. So from the available evidence in patients who have selected major NNRTI mutations, it wouldn't be advisable to give real P-virin. That is my opinion. So I don't think they would have done the same, but they didn't report that in this study. And the patients who were recruited to get, to get capotegravir and real P-virin all had fully suppressed viral load. I hope that that addresses, addresses the question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thanks. I think Dr. Ray uh, has also his hand up. Good evening and thanks for the opportunity. Thanks Dr. Tadese for the great presentation. We really learned a lot. I have just two questions which I posted. The first one is on the study which was conducted, uh, you said the South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, Botswana, on uh, the people who were failing uh, first line who were on uh, TDF, RTC, and uh, Dolute Grava, and those who were on Efavirens. But it's uh, 96, 96 weeks, uh, you said uh, they managed to suppress those who were on uh, TLD with 95% and those on the TLE with 66% uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, what was the key point you mentioned about adherence? There was some intervention surely which they did. Uh, I'm wondering just if uh, you have some of those uh, adherence interventions, how they could manage, how did they manage to follow them up closely so that they are there to treat to their treatment and the money to suppress. Because currently in our, in our setting, we are facing challenge with some patients with low level viremia between uh, 40 and 1,000 uh, that uh, they are still uh, not suppressing. And we would like maybe to get some of the tips in order to assist our patient to suppress. The second one, it's on prep. Uh, just to know if there was any side effect or major side effect using uh, the long acting uh, carbotegravy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Um, a very important question. So let's start from the first one. Um, in this study, actually they used the WHO recommendations in terms of adherence counseling, more frequent visits, um, sitting down and giving the education 
by understanding what what barriers for adherence are there and then intervening on them patient education was central so they followed the pragmatic who adherence intensification procedure which which so they they have not gone into extraordinary or clinical trial type um, adherence interventions so that that worked but there is, I think there is another layer to, to your question, which, which has been worrying. And I think it was also worrying, worrying us um, uh, to the level that they were raising alarm, uh, alarm bells when I was there, which was persistent low level viremias, uh, especially viremia between 200 and 1,000. Uh, the very low level viremia between 50 and 200 might not be too worrisome, but those in between 200 to 1,000, one, one needs really to, to, to look into. And if despite, if despite real good adherence that the patient, the healthcare provider and the patient do agree to, in other words, if the patient is really adherent to the medications, not only taking the medications every day, but other aspects of adherence. For example, many people in Namibia and elsewhere, they may take herbal medications. They may go to traditional healers. We do not know the drug-drug interactions with the herbals that they take that might also affect the bioavailability of the medicines leading to suboptimal concentration and also suboptimal suppression. If all those issues are addressed um, and then the patient is not really adherent, then I would say it is a reason to suspect some circulating resistant virus in the minority population. It could be a matter of time before this low-level viremia emerge into full-blown virologic failure with accumulation of resistance. So I think looking into that will be very important, Doctor. Otherwise, the usual intensification of adherence counseling, but focusing on smartly and systematically identifying the major barriers for adherence and then addressing those would be, would be critical. And one of the determinants of that, as you know, is disclosure, especially in serodiscordant couples common in Northern Namibia. We've been there, we've been practicing there. So looking into all those parameters is important, but that pragmatic, um, adherence counseling, intensification, and viral load testing can actually bring a change. And when I say the pragmatic WHO approach, we're looking about talking about the differentiated HIV care service in which adherence is, is, is central. Moving into your second question, in terms of long-acting injectables, what was reported was only injection site uh, reactions, but none of them were major leading to um, interruption of uh, the injectables, which is which is a positive thing. But again, looking into a larger, because these are not great number of people. Uh, I think uh, what is important is to to look at even greater, more, more, uh, more representative representative data. But we we don't expect the carbotegravir to be uh, heavily bad drug as compared to other integrase inhibitors. But injection site uh, pain was of the most frequent uh, reaction that was reported in the study. But I think we have, we have learned a lot about carbotegravir from the different trials in the different countries. I think what is so compelling and really positive in this study was that community healthcare workers were able to administer it. So we can really demedicalize that later on when we have it in Africa as well. Um, doctor, doctor, if that address your question, uh, great, but feel free to come in if, if not. Okay. Thank you then, very much, doctor. You have uh, clarified well. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Then, Bill, um, is a question from Dr. Civile, is the emergence of hypertension independent of weight gain? Doc, I couldn't see any, any report around the correlation of treatment emergent hypertension with the weight gain. We believe that 
higher weight gain could contribute to an added risk of hypertension, but I couldn't see any data in this report that actually correlated the weight gain with the risk of hypertension. But we can look into other data sets or we can also inquire from the investigators further. Um, I think there's a question from Dr. Vit Vitalis Kvava. Sorry, sorry, Vitalis, um, your voice is very distant. If you can speak louder, please. All right. Uh, so when you presented on Doravin and the you mentioned the issues of lymphopenia uh, uh, in terms of uh, treatment. I wanted to know if the patients that you received in case of the prophylaxis with exercise uh, was there such any such uh, report of uh, lymphopenia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vitalis. If I heard you, you were asking if there was any side effect of Islatravir or lympho in form of lymphopenia when they received it for PrEP. Um, so, you know, the PrEP was not tried in patients with Islatravir. It was an in vitro and in vivo PK profile that was modeled and it has not been tried in a clinical trial setting. So still very preclinical and even in an in vitro and a rat model. So that those two curves which I showed were done in rats where the release of 299 days was observed. So we will have to wait and see how the effect will be in a clinical setting in human subjects that is not yet done. Thank you. Um, Bill, Dr. Stone, we are now over 8.45. We are over time. Thank yeah. you, Dr. T. That was an amazing presentation. And I hope Thank we can you. get you back on again. And I think that over the next two or three weeks, we all need to think about the questions that need to be answered. And then I think a QA and a session on the 30th of August would be a really good um, thing to aim for. Um, and just thank you, Dr. T. It's, it's been an absolute privilege to hear you speak. And thank you for opening our minds. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spohn. Thank you, Avakia. Thank you, Intellectus Campus. And uh, more importantly, thank you, the, all the colleagues from all across Africa. And I see also some from, uh, from Europe, I, I, I believe. We learn together and thank you for the opportunity. We'll interact soon again. Over.